All right, good evening, Cornerstone Baptist Church. If you would, let's uh, stand, and you can grab your hymnal there. We're going to sing at Calvary, page 338. As, let's all uh, stand there, if you would, if you're able. Verse number one there, at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Verse 4 there. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. If you wouldn't remain standing for our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, the time that we have to come together to learn more about your word, to learn about more about Calvary, Lord. Each and every one of us has been there, and uh, if you uh, have been lost and without hope, Lord, uh, the mercy that we found there, we can never, we can never be able to repay, but Lord, we love you, and we'll, we'll take and serve you as long as we're here. Father, just bless Cornerstone, bless our uh, meeting tonight, Lord, that uh, uh, we might just be of one accord. Lord, we thank you for uh, all the blessings that you've done in the past and what you're doing in our lives today, and Lord, what we have to look forward to. And we just pray that you just be with us this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would turn over to page 508, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Amen. Page 508. Yes, I'll sing that wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Let's take this time, turn around and shake somebody's hand uh, behind you.
page 508 on that third verse, Days of Darkness. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrow's path I often tread, but the Savior still is with me, by his hand I'm safely led. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Let's continue on that fourth verse there. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Amen. Great singing. You can be seated. Well, good evening and welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. So happy to see you here tonight. And uh, we have uh, several things going on I want to remind you about. Don't forget about this Sunday. This Sunday we're going to be having the tent service. Uh, the weather looks like it's going to do well and cooperate. And uh, it's Indiana. That could change. But I would bring an umbrella just in case. Uh, but it, right now it looks beautiful. And uh, we're going to have a good uh, tent uh, meeting. And so if you wanted to... Um, bring something in to be a blessing we're, we're asking folks to bring in side dishes for that and the church will be providing the uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and so uh, if you could bring in dessert or different sides and then just bring that into the kitchen like you normally would on a fifth Sunday and we'll have people that are designated to go get it and bring it and set it up a um, little bit of instruction for Sunday uh, we're gonna ask everyone to pack a park in the back of the parking lot and then we're going to, the, the parking lot uh, on the fence line of the playground, uh, of, I don't know how to say this, um, we're going to reserve that for the older folks. Older folks, okay, I'll let you decide what older is, okay. If you are able to walk longer distances than the older folks, okay, uh, park further away back there in the center section and let the older folks uh, uh, park along the fence line of the playground and then if anyone is, is, is handicapped cannot walk um, very far at all we're going to let you pull in on the entrance by the, the dumpster and then watch out for the retention pond we're going to have that coned off but then turn right by the retention pond and then pull right alongside we're going to have a VIP parking for you right alongside the tent and uh, that's that's if you if you don't like walking that far you can't walk that far We'll have that parking for you. And then we are going to have uh, Porta Johns out there so you don't have to trek back and forth to go to the restroom. It's going to be the kind with the, with the sink in it. And uh, it'll, it'll be a, a good, good day. And so please continue to pray for the weather. And then there is on Facebook, the church Facebook account, I do have a map that's kind of give you directional arrows and different uh, instructions. There's going to be three access points to the tent. Uh, the, the gate closest to the bus barn and then there's the uh, far to the to the left of the playground that gate, and then obviously the folks that are going to be parking near the tent by the dumpster. Okay, um, the Sunday school hour is going to be a special patriotic hour. We're going to have poems and scripture verses, songs and instrumental um, in, uh, specials, instrumental specials, and um, it'll be a good day. Uh, teens through adults will be under under the tent. Uh, for all the services, Sunday school at 10, and then 11 o'clock, we'll have a pitch-in ap after the 11 o'clock service, and then an afternoon uh, service in place of the 6 p.m. service. Uh, and then uh, you can drive up to the carport, and you can walk either walk your child to the, the nursery or walk them to the uh, Sunday school department, but nursery through junior church age children are going to be in their normal spots, Okay. Only the teens through adults will be under the tent. Okay, and then uh, another announcement is this. Pray for uh, our 4th of July parade that we're going to be in for the city of Lawrence. And then we're also going to be a vendor later on in the evening. And so anyone that wants to be a part of the parade, last year we passed out um, information and it was a good time. Uh, 
we're going to meet at the church parking lot um, at 8.30, and we're going to head out, and we have to be in line by 9 o'clock. And so we're going to meet at the church. If you wanted to meet us directly at, on site, the, we're going to be meeting at 7510 East 53rd Street. That's Harrison Hill Elementary. And then we're going to probably be 45 minutes, and then we're done with that. And then we're going to meet back at the church at 4 o'clock, and then we're going to get things ready to be a vendor, and then we'll stay until 7 o'clock. All right, also, we're having a church work day, July 13th at 9 o'clock, and uh, Brother Anderson will be heading that up. And we're going to have different uh, things that everyone can do. We have organ organizing stuff, uh, deep cleaning, more of the, the maintenance type stuff as well. And so if you're able to help, we appreciate your help. And uh, show up at 9 o'clock, and Brother Anderson will get you pointed uh, in the right direction. Also, be in prayer for junior camp. How many kids here are going to junior camp? Anybody going to junior camp here? Awesome. Okay. That's going to be uh, July 8th through the 12th, so pray for that. And then also pray for uh, teen camp, July 15th through uh, the 19th. Uh, just a couple folks to update you on with a prayer list. Pray for Miss Ledbetter. She's home and resting and recovering. Also pray for Brother Marty Thompson. Um, he's not doing well. Uh, he's sleeping a lot and uh, not eating. And hospice has been called in. And uh, just, just pray for him. And also he's not been sleep. Uh, he's been sleeping, but Mrs. Thompson has not been sleeping. And so uh, pray for Mrs. Thompson. Uh, Mrs. Twig has sores on the bottom of her feet and her feet are swelling. And so just pray for her. And then also pray for Joe, that's Mrs. McNamara's dad, who's having a back surgery July 18th. And then pray for uh, Miss Venus. She has uh, nerve pain in her back and neck. And uh, she's needing to get an MRI before the surgeon will see her. The doctor will see her. So just uh, be in prayer for Miss Venus. And uh, pray for Zachary uh, Sipe, uh, one of our uh, school kids. Uh, went to the hospital yesterday with breathing complications. I guess a very serious asthma attack. And so pray for Zach. Uh, he is home, but just pray for him um, as he recovers from that. And we'll say more about the prayer list here in a moment. And uh, once again, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, on the back of the table in the lobby, we have a free devotional that my home church puts out. The Deep and Wide devotional is back there. It's a free resource, so please grab one on your way out, and I'm sure it'll be a blessing for you. Let's go ahead and pray for the offering at this time. Abilities you give us, Lord, to uh, earn a living, Lord, and Father, just pray now as we take time to give our tithes and offerings, Lord, that um, you would bless the monies and, and just multiply them greatly, Lord, as you always have, and, and that, so that might take care of the needs of the church here and um, our community here, and Father, also uh, folks around the world, Lord, that need to hear the gospel and be saved. And Father, we just love you and praise you and we thank you for it all in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and turn to page 417 there. No one understands like Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing that first and that last verse there. 417. He's a friend beyond compare. Page 417. No one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne.
verse 4 there. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Though you fail him sadly, fail him. He will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim no one is so near so dear as jesus cast your every care on him All right, thank you you may be seated all right well welcome once again to cornerstone baptist church and if you have your bibles turn with me to proverbs chapter 6 proverbs chapter 6 we're going to pick it up, read one verse to start off with and jump right in. We're going to continue with the, the things that God hates that we find in uh, Proverbs chapter 6. And last several weeks we've spoken about uh, God hating pride, all, all forms of pride. And now we're going to look at the next thing on the list in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number uh, 17. In any, all the, I see some kids here tonight, so we're going to do this uh, kids that are want to take want to take notes tonight the word is lying every time you hear the word lie or lying okay make sure you make a mark and then turn that in to my wife and we'll see who the winner is lying and lie okay all right god hates lying and we're going to find out a little bit more about specifically about that in the scripture tonight proverbs chapter 6 verse 17 the bible says this a proud look and then it says this, a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. And then it says, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. I'm not sure we'll get to it tonight, but you ever wonder why lying seems to be mentioned twice here? We have a lying tongue, and then we have a false witness that speaketh lies. Isn't that the same thing? Why is it mentioned twice? Well, I think I have an answer for you, and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But as a way of introduction, have you ever heard this saying? He, or she, would rather climb a tree to tell a lie than to stand on the ground and tell the truth. You ever heard that before? You ever heard that before? What's the saying that people say when someone just goes out of their way to lie? That, that guy would rather climb a tree to tell a lie than to stand on the ground and tell the truth. Have you ever met someone like that? If they're here tonight, don't point at them, okay? All right, are, are you that way? Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully no, no Christian should be characterized as that way. But ha have you ever said this, okay? Don't lie. We're talking about lying, especially in church. Have you ever said this? Well, it's just a little white lie. Uh, just a little white lie. I know I've said that before too, and people try to use that to justify the fact that they just lied and saying, well, it wasn't a big one, it wasn't a whopper, it was just a little white lie. Well, to a holy God, there is no such thing as a little white lie. Lying is lying, and according to scripture, God hates lying. What is a lie? Let me, we got some smart kids here tonight. Okay, smart kids here tonight. Uh, what is lying? Someone tell me. Raise your hand and tell me what lying is. What do you think lying is? Yes, sir. I got 30 minutes tonight, buddy. What's going on? He went blank. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Yes, Zach. Okay, yeah, saying you, you didn't take something when you did. Here, here's a definition I came up with, and I think it's pretty fitting. A lie is this. A lie is anything that is not 100% true 100% of the time. A lie is anything that is not 100% true 100% of the time, and it is the exact opposite of truth. And the truth is we all are or uh, have been guilty of lying. Is lying a sin? Is lying a sin? What do you think? Kids, what do you think? Is lying a sin? Yes, it is a sin. And how do we determine that? How do we know that lying is a sin? Any kid want to answer that? How do we know that lying is a sin? Just because I say it or mom and daddy say it? What do you think? Yes, ma'am, way in the back. A 
okay, you do it all the time. That's definitely bad. That's definitely bad. Why do we, how do we know that lying is, is a sin? Why, yes, ma'am. Okay, it's from sin. Yeah, what do you, what do you think? What is it? It's in the Ten Commandments. That's right. The Bible says so, and it's in the Ten Commandments. Those are all good answers. And the fact that God hates it and describes it in the Scripture as an abomination shows us that it's sin. And God would not hate something that was not sinful. And look at Proverbs chapter 12. You're in Proverbs. Turn to your right a couple pages. Proverbs chapter 12, in verse number 22, the Bible says this. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. God hates lying. You know why? Because it goes against his nature of being true. He is uh, characterized as being true, and uh, lying goes against his nature. And he desires to delight in us when we are living true and we're, we're living honest lives. Uh, Psalms 101 verse 7 says this. Psalms 101 verse 7 says, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. One of the reasons we should not lie is because it goes against the nature of God that we are trying to be like. We're trying to be like God, and God is true, and that goes against what we're trying to be like God in. But then the next reason we shouldn't lie is because sin, especially lying, separates us from enjoying a close fellowship with God. God, since the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, desired to have fellowship with man, with mankind. And sin, sin separated Adam and Eve from having that fellowship with God, and it will do the same to you and I. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians 3 verses 9 through 10, the Bible says this, it says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You know, as a born-again believer, our lives should no longer be characterized by lies and deceit the way that it was before we trusted Christ as our Savior. Before we were saved, it, you would only expect a, a lost person to act that way, dishonestly, deceitfully, lying, and, and all the rest of the things we could name. But a child of God should no longer be characterized that way. A Christian should not live their lives the same way as they did before they got saved. Uh, that, that children's song, the things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. And there should be a great change in our lives since we've been born again. Now as a born again child of God, we should walk honestly and live in truthfulness and put off lying. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And then in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19, the Bible says this. In Proverbs 12, 19, the Bible says, The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. You know what the blessing of being honest is, kids and all of us here tonight? The blessing of, of telling the truth, you don't have to worry about what you're saying. When you're honest, you don't have to worry about keeping your story correct every time you tell the story. You don't have to look over your shoulder. There's no, there's no stress, there's no anxiety, there's no fear about it. The truth, the blessing of being truthful is you don't have to worry about anything. It's true. The truth will prevail, but contrary to that, a lie will bring stress, worry, fear, more lies, and ultimately punishment as well. People often lie to get out of trouble, and that may work temporarily, but all lying leads to is just more trouble. I mean, I'm not going to ask you for specifics tonight, examples. How many of you have ever told a lie to cover for a lie? Have you ever told a lie, but you're, you're, you're worried about raising your hand in church? Okay, we, we, probably a lot of us have. We've told a lie to cover a lie that we've told. And then what happens with that? The problem with that is when you lie to cover a lie, you constantly have to keep lying to cover all those lies. And eventually you're just piled up with lies and it's just this big, awful mess. Well, the honesty, honesty truthfully is the best policy because you don't have to worry about 
all the things that someone that lies to cover lies have to worry about. I found this quote, I don't know who to give credit for about this, but I found this quote about the subject. It says this, he who tells a lie is not sensible of how great a task he undertakes, for he must be forced to invent 20 more to maintain that one. And that's so true. In the moment, lying to cover a lie seems like a good choice. But when you, when, you, when you think about all the lies you have to tell to maintain that, it's not a good choice at all. In John chapter 8, verse 44, in John chapter 8, verse 44, the Bible says this, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You know, all lies are sinful. All lies are sinful. And all lies originate with the father of lies, the devil. And it, look at that phrase where it says, there is no truth in him. There is no truth in him. If that statement's true, describing Satan, then anything he says, anything he tries to sell you and I can't be trusted. Because there's no truth in him. But so many people, sadly enough, they buy into the devil's lies and, and they think that that's what's best for them. And it's not. It's not. There is no truth in him. I'm going to give you one example about this. We have the example of Adam and Eve. We have the example of Adam and Eve. Turn quickly to Genesis chapter 3 and we'll see an example of this. Of man believing what the devil says as truth when there's no truth in him and uh, they were deceived adam and eve were surely deceived and beguiled by the serpent by the devil in genesis chapter 3 and verse number 4 the bible says this it says and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die ye shall not surely die so the devil's telling them uh, to eve to take of the tree and someone help me out tonight. Kids, help me out. What is the, what's the name of that tree they were not supposed to eat from? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They could eat from any other tree in the garden, save one. And that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when the, the devil initially tempted Eve with this, Eve repeated the instructions from God. And a response from the devil was, ye shall not surely die. I know the God creator of the heaven said that you're going to die in the moment that you eat, but you're not going to die. And the serpent tricked the woman by casting doubt, disparaging the commandments that God had given. And let's look at that commandment that God gave them in Genesis chapter 2.17. In Genesis chapter 2.17, the Bible says this. This is God speaking to Adam and Eve, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. Can't be any clearer than that. Don't eat of it. Don't eat of it. But it says this, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. That was God's warning. That was God's instruction and commandment to, to Adam and Eve. And the devil is now saying, Oh, I know that's what you heard, but it's not true. It's not true. Well, when Adam and Eve took of that fruit and ate of that fruit, they died spiritually the moment they disobeyed God. They died spiritually the moment they disobeyed God. Some critics would say, well, God got it wrong. It says they, would, they shall surely die in the day that they should eat of it. But they ate and they lived to be uh, old. I mean, so there you go. But listen, the death that was being referenced, surely it meant the curse of sin resulted in uh, mortality and death. But what he was talking about in the moment that you shall eat it, he was talking about spiritual death. About spiritual death. And they died spiritually the moment that they ate the fruit that God had warned them not to. I'll give you some proof of that if you ever meet someone that criticizes that part of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. They died spiritually and were ashamed of their nakedness. 
the fact that they were ashamed and recognized their own nakedness shows that things had changed in the moment that they ate of the fruit. They died spiritually because of their shame that they experienced regarding their nakedness. Look at it in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 25. The Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so that's before the curse. They were naked, but they weren't ashamed. Now let's see, now after they took of the fruit, they weren't supposed to. Let's see what resulted in that. Before they were that way, but they didn't experience any shame. They didn't, they didn't think anything of it. Now in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible says this. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The moment that they ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. And a way that we know that was they, they recognized their nakedness and experienced shame about that. They died spiritually and needed a blood sacrifice for their sins. They died spiritually and needed a blood sacrifice for their sins. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, the Bible says this, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. There was no need before they ate of the fruit for any type of covering. But now that they sinned, now that they stood in need of redemption, they, they needed to be covered and supernaturally covered and, and not by their own efforts. And that's a, that, that'll preach in itself. Man, in his own effort, tried to solve the problem but was inadequate. And every time today that we try to solve our own salvation with our works that we do, it's completely inadequate as well. Only a supernatural covering, a supernatural sacrifice had to be made for their sins. They died spiritually. They died spiritually and were separated from God's presence. They died spiritually and were separated from God's presence. Before they sinned, they enjoyed fellowship with the Lord. Every day, the Bible says they walked in the cool of the day and experienced that fellowship and communion with the Lord. But after they sinned, a result of that, the punishment of that sin was to be separated from God's presence. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says this. In Genesis 3, 23, the Bible says this. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. No longer could they enjoy that fellowship. They were separated from God's presence because of their sin. They died spiritually. They, they died the moment they sinned when their immor immortality was made mortal. You know, had Adam and Eve not partaken of that fruit and disobeyed God, they would have lived forever. But the moment that they, they, they sinned, it started the time clock of their death. They started, uh, they changed from immortal to mortal. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, we see this, the mortality of Adam after he had sinned. And I know about you, I mean, I feel old at 33, but can you imagine living to be 930 years old? 930. You definitely would be parking by the tent when you're 930 years old, okay? I'm telling you what, you probably wouldn't even get out of your car. You probably wouldn't leave the house at 930 years old, okay? But Adam and Eve lived to be a long time. But the point here is this, he died. He died, and that was a direct result of the sin that he committed against God in the Garden of Eden. Had he not sinned, he would have lived indefinitely. And the Bible says, in all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So we see an example of someone that bought the devil's lie. Someone that believed the word of Satan to be anything else but lies. It ended in separation, death. And the curse. Nothing good ever happens by believing the devil's uh, lines that he's sharing with you. But I want you to see something real quick, and we'll wrap it up with this tonight. 
why does it mention a lying tongue in Proverbs 6, 17, and then a false witness that speaketh lies again in verse number 19? Aren't they the same thing? Well, I think I have a solution for this. They both talk about lying, sure, but I think they, they talk about two separate aspects involved in lying. Here's two separate, two separate aspects that these, these reference. Let's look at the first one, a lying tongue. A lying tongue, it seems to me to, to indicate lying in a general sense, a general sense on, a, on an individual basis. It represents the will or desire of an individual to lie. It's a general uh, lying in a general sense. We look at it in Proverbs 26, 28. Proverbs 26, 28 says this, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Some people actually enjoy lying. Some people enjoy lying. They enjoy embellishing details and stories uh, to make themselves uh, seem more interesting than they really are. Some people enjoy uh, making up these lies to get away with things. Uh, they, lie to enjoy, they, they lie to enjoy the reaction that their lie gets from other people. Some people lie because they've, have, they've lied so much that they don't even know what's true anymore. Some people just enjoy lying. And then we see in Proverbs, uh, Psalms 31, 18. Psalms 31, 18, the Bible says this. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously. Notice the next three words. Against the who? Against the righteous. So I think we get, when, whenever you study that, that phrase out, lying lips, you kind of get this overall theme. It's an overall theme of, of lying in regards of opposing righteousness. Lying against the righteous. I believe it means this. A lying tongue references a direct attack against the righteous truth of God. The righteous truth of God. And can you imagine when we think about some examples of this, why God hates that? Why God hates it? God hates when anybody lies, but when, you, when your lie is directly opposing the truth and his righteousness, can't you see why God would hate that? God hates when man's lies are done in the name of righteousness. God hates when man's lies are done in the name of righteousness. What do I mean? Well, let me read a verse to you, then we'll explain that. In Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Go to Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says this, holding fast the faithful word, the faithful word. What is that talking about? What are we supposed to be holding fast to? Uh, the faithful word, the word of God that we have, uh, the word of God that contains the truth and the right doctrine. That's what we're supposed to hold fast to. As he that hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine. That's what we should hold fast to, sound doctrine. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For they are many unruly and vain talkers and, what's the next word? Deceivers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. You know what God hates? God hates lying completely in, in, in every sense. But God hates lies that are done in the name of righteousness. And I think of examples of people that are deceivers specifically for the intent to gain filthy lucres. When we think about that, I can't help but think about televangelists. Televangelists. God hates those who purposefully deceive others in the name of righteousness, in the name of religion. False teachers, liars, deceivers who lie for the sole sake of lining their own pockets with their victim's money. Televangelists, self-proclaimed prophets, uh, name it and claim it, preachers, and the other crowd that's out there. Those that are deceiving people. With the guise of it being something that God told them to do. I, I got so mad. I got so mad. I watched a video of somebody, a prophet, 
that brought up a guy from the crowd. And they're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, an impoverished area, Nigeria. And they brought this guy, and he holds up a mic to his, his, the guy's mouth and says, uh, the, the prophet said, uh, God told me for you to give me every dollar that you have in your pocket. Every dollar that you have. And he gave it to him. And everybody's, hey, man, oh, that's awesome. And he said, I want you to, got his phone out. I want you to, 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 I don't understand this, but somehow electronically transfer every dollar out of his bank account into this prophet's bank account. Right there, it's on Facebook, it's recorded, and there's a mob right there. People with a brain would be like, uh, that's not right. But people that are deceived do it, thinking they're gaining God's favor by doing that. Who would do that? Someone that's purposely deceiving others in the name of righteousness. God hates that. God hates that. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, the Bible says this, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, notice this part, nor handling the word of God, what's the next word? Deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That shows us the next thing that God hates uh, in, in terms of lying. God hates anyone who twists the scripture to make it appear to say anything else but what it actually says. We have the word of truth. Do you believe that tonight? We have the Bible that is the source of truth. And when somebody intentionally goes to the source of truth and twists the scriptures to make it say something it clearly doesn't say, God hates that. Because that's deceitful, that's dishonest, that's lying. You as a representative, a representative of God are saying and claiming that the word of God says something that it doesn't. That's dishonest and that's lying. People do it all the time. They take a passage and they take it out of context and they twist it to make it fit their agenda and their preference, their beliefs, and God hates that garbage. You know what it is? Let God be true and just open the book and share what the book says and let God do a work in people's hearts. Don't have to twist the scriptures. Anyone who intentionally takes the scripture out of context and twists it it's dishonest and deceitful. God hates that. God hates that. Let me give you an example of why context is important, okay? Greet thy brother with a holy kiss, right? Aren't you glad that we don't live in that, that culture anymore, right? Because I, I like my personal space. I don't want anybody coming up here and uh, that's not my, uh, no. Uh, aren't you glad we're not in Europe and different places like that? But there are cultures that are that way. Greet thy brother with a holy kiss. It, in context, it makes sense of the culture of the day. That's how they would greet each other. It's, it's something that, it's, it's very cultural, it's friendly, it's hospitable, it's welcoming, and it's friendly. You take that out of context, you can make that seem very homosexual. Do you see where that, that could be uh, headed very quickly? And that's why context is so, so very important. Nobody in their right mind reading the context would ever believe that if that was said. But people that uh, follow other uh, preachers and teachers that uh, take things out of context all the time, man, they would be deceived. And that's, that's what we're warned against right here. God hates that. Let me give you one more and we'll stop. A lying tongue, a lying tongue, summarize, a lying tongue is a specific lie, a specific lie that affects the righteous things of God and misleads others away from the truth. I believe that's what's being referenced here. And as you study that phrase out in scripture, I think you'll see the same thing. It's a specific lie that affects the righteous things of God and misleads others away from the truth. A false witness that speaketh lies. Isn't that the same thing? Well, I believe it's a little bit different. Let me share it with you. A false witness that speaketh lies. And I believe this, this is a specific reference to lying against the character or reputation of another. It's a, a specific lying against the character or reputation of another. Uh, let me give you an example. A witness, a, a character witness. You ever heard that before in a court setting? You call in character witnesses that either have a negative or a positive effect on the character of the defendant or the one that's on trial. A witness, in any case, their only job is to do what? 
Their only job is to share truthful facts about the one that they're either witnessing for or witnessing against. Their only job is to tell the truth. My soul, uh, they used to, I don't know if they do or not anymore, but they used to have you swear in to be a witness and say, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help, so help you God. I do. I swear, whatever it is. You swear to tell the truth. That's the witness's job. They give an oath under law to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. But many times, we've seen this on the news recently, many times either the prosecutor or the defense attorney work with the witnesses, work on their story, get it ironclad. It don't matter if it's the truth or not. They work on a story that serves the best interest of their client. And they manipulate the testimony to serve the best interest of their own clients. If any witness were to share a testimony that was not entirely true or it contradicted, it would be worthless. The, the jury would be encouraged to disregard that. And that's what the, the defense and the cross-examination, that's what that's for. To point out inconsistencies in someone's witness and testimony. To get it thrown out or dismissed. God hates it when people lie in an effort to attack someone's character or testimony. God hates false accusations. An example of this we see in the scripture is this. The very life of Jesus himself. We see the pay. They actually had to pay false witnesses that testified falsely against Jesus. In Mark chapter 14 verses 56 through 59. The Bible says this. For many bear false witness against him. But their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. God hates any lie that is disparaging on someone else's character. And, and Jesus himself personally experienced this type of lying and deceit and false witness when it was even against him it was thrown against him the greatest lie someone said this too i found this the greatest lie anyone tells is the lie they tell themselves the greatest lie anyone tells is the lie they tell themselves i want to give you give you some lies here the greatest lies we tell ourselves what are the greatest lies we tell ourselves? Well, the greatest lie we tell ourselves is when we lie, when we tell ourselves we're fine when we're not. We're fine when we're not. Uh, we have a good example of this in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. You, are you familiar, familiar with the story of Gehazi? Gehazi. Uh, let's pick it up in uh, verse 21. It says, so Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? Is all well? Is everything okay? Uh, I, I, we, left your, we left your master and he said, you know, you didn't need anything and we, we went our separate ways. Is everything okay? And what was Gehazi's response? Well, considering that Gehazi uh, was being dishonest, he left his master, he was supposed to be with his master, he left his master and followed after, uh, followed after uh, Elijah. And so, um, so now we see here, and he said, all is well, I'm sorry, no, followed after Naaman. And he said, all is well, my master have sent me saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of prophets, give them, I pray thee, a town of silver and two changes, changes of garments. You know, we have an example here of someone that's lying not only to somebody else, because surely that last story was false. There were no two young men that came to them, and uh, uh, his master didn't tell him to go fetch, fetch these garments and what, what he's asking from them. So he's lying to Naaman, but long before he not lied to Naaman, he lied to himself. Long before, in, in his mind, he thought, is this a good idea? Should I be doing this? Is it okay for me to do this? Yeah, you deserve it. You're just a servant. You deserve it. And he lied to himself, and then he's lying again here. It says, is all well? And then he says this, all is well. Is that true tonight? Was everything well in Gehazi's life? You're lying. You're 
obviously greedy and covetous. You're willing to make up this lie just so you can gain some possessions and you're leaving your master. No, the truth is everything wasn't okay. He was not well. So he's lying after lie after lie. Lying to himself, lying to Naaman. And the greatest lie we tell ourselves is everything's fine when it's not. And we'll pick up the rest next week. And uh, we'll pick it up with uh, where we left off next week. And um, Does everybody have a prayer list tonight, a prayer bulletin tonight? Does anybody need a prayer bulletin? Would you raise your hand up? We'll get you one. Okay, we got one. We need one right here, Donnie. Uh, Bruce, raise your hand up. Anybody else need a prayer bulletin? A prayer sheet right there. We got um, Bonnie and then Bruce. Anybody else need a prayer? Oh, over here. Um, both. Okay. Alrighty, so we're going to go through and pray through the prayer list for the next few moments that we have tonight, and I want to encourage you to include on there, uh, pray for um, Venus's neck with a pinched nerve, that means pray that she gets seen uh, by a doctor with get an MRI. Uh, pray for Brother Jim Mitchell, um, he's dealing with some blood pressure issues, and uh, just pray for him, he's, he's very discouraged, we visited him recently, very discouraged, and uh, he, he said he's been to the hospital like three times in a month. And he's just discouraged, so pray for Brother Jim Mitchell. Uh, pray for um, Pastor Mitchell rehabbing with his hand, and then Mrs. Mitchell with her back pain that's bothering her and the other health needs that she has. Oh, and I got a note here from Edna. Pray for Edna, um, who's, who's getting an upper, has an upper GI scheduled for July 8th. So pray for Edna. And then um, there was another request I had written down. Pray for Jeff Cover, um, Rhonda Cover's uh, husband, who's not doing very well, uh, dealing with dementia and different problems. Pray for pray for him, and also continue to pray for Wilma Redding, um, who still needs her insurance company to pay for her long term care. She's paying for that out of pocket right now. And I think that's. Do we have any other prayer requests to add tonight? Any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. Definitely pray for, yeah, no problem. Definitely pray for that. Any other prayer requests tonight? Any other prayer requests? Pray for, oh, oh can, we, can, let's, can we do that at the end? We'll pray and then we'll do it at the end, okay? Okay, good deal. Um, let's see, there was, where's, uh, she's not here, okay. Pray for Bonnie Clark. I'm going to get the exact date from her, but pray for Bonnie Clark. She's leaving for Botswana soon and just pray for her and pray for, oh, right there, I'm so sorry. W- when, what day exactly are you leaving for Botswana? Definitely pray for that. Anybody else before we pray? Anybody else? Yes, sir. All right. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and pray. And then, yes, ma'am. Thank you for sharing that. That's exciting. We definitely pray for that. Anybody else have anything? Uh, continue to pray for Brother Daryl Tarr and his chemo. Um, how many more does he have? Three more? Three more left. And so pray that he's in complete remission when it's all said and done. So, All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll, we'll um, have uh, some people that share some testimonies as well at the end. And so let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll, uh, we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and being so good to us. And Father, we can't thank you and praise you enough for how good you are to us and just the fact that you were willing to die on the cross for us and shed your blood for us that we may go to heaven is just enough to thank you the rest of our life for. 
but just to prove how good you are. You just you hear our prayers. You have a heart inclined to meet our needs. And Lord, you're so faithful to provide for us and protect us and uh, answer prayers. Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, more importantly than what you do for us is we're thankful for who you are, that you are true, that you are just and holy and righteous and lovely. Lord, so thankful for who you are and uh, for the God that you are to every one of us. And we're thankful for the word of God that we have in our possession tonight. Help us to tre- treasure it and, and treasure it, Lord, and, and just uh, read it every day and uh, seek it as the truth for all of our areas of our life where we need guidance and wisdom in, Lord. I pray that we'd apply it to our lives. And Lord, I just thank you so much for a church that has a heart to pray for each other and to help each other, Lord, and uh, just a giving church. Lord, I just so thankful for a part of, to be a part of a church like this. And Father, there's so many people in our church family that have so many needs, Lord, so many physical needs, emotional needs, financial needs, Lord. Please be with Brother Marty, Lord, as, he's, as he seems to be close to crossing into glory, Lord. I pray that you would just be with him every step of the way. I pray that you would just comfort Miss Evelyn's heart, who's just overwhelmed right now with uh, decisions that are having to be made and arrangements and things like that. Father, please be with her. Help her to hold it together and to be strong for him and her son Perry and the family. And just please be with her in the, in the days and the weeks and months ahead. Be with all the widows that are still, years later, still missing their, their loved ones. Please comfort their hearts and be with them, Lord. I pray that you be with uh, Brother Jim Mitchell, who's discouraged after being in the hospital quite a bit, Lord, this month. And I pray that you would just help his blood pressure to regulate and he wouldn't have any issues with that. Please be with Ms. Venus's neck and back and the ner- nerves that are bothering her. I pray that she would get be seen by the doctor, get the MRI to be seen by a surgeon. Father, I pray that you'd be with um, Bruce's request for the blood clot. I pray that you'd be with um, that the man that needs prayer, Lord. And just please be with Dan Pointer as he's got a pretty serious surgery coming up. And I pray that you guide the hands of the surgeons. Please be with those that are recovering and rehabbing from injuries, Lord. Mrs. Ledbetter, Mrs. Longworth, and several others, Lord. Pastor Mitchell with his hand. Please be with Brother Billy Johnson as he's just uh, monitoring the situation. Give him wisdom and be with him, Lord. Please be with Larry Anderson's a foot that's bothering him and hurting him, Lord. Uh, please be with um, the job interview coming up. We praise you for the good report that we got from Miss Christine. I pray that you would uh, guide through the next uh, interview. I pray that you lead her and give her uh, peace about whichever job is best that you want her to have, Lord. And uh, please be with Daryl as he's continuing his chemo and his heals his, his body, helping to rid his body of the cancer and to make a full recovery. Uh, Lord, just please be with um, Miss McNamara's dad. Uh, who's dealing with um, the back surgery coming up soon. Lord, I pray you be with him, and I pray that you ease his pain. I know it's got to be excruciating, and I pray that you give him ease of his symptoms, and Lord, just please help the procedure he's getting done to alleviate the pain and help the problem, Lord, and just please be with him. And uh, Lord, just please be with all the requests. I may have forgotten some, but you know exactly what they are and what their needs are. I pray that you meet all the needs and according to your will, Lord, and I pray that you help have your hand upon Cornerstone and uh, bring us families that we need, Lord, that will be a, a help to our body here and uh, would uh, see the vision that you have for this place, Lord, and see how they fit into that vision and how they could help this place be what you want it to be. I pray that we continue to see souls saved and discipled and baptized and, uh, Lord, growing in their new faith. And I pray that you would just receive all the glory and honor from it. And, Father, I pray that you, you have your hand upon uh, Miss bon, uh, Miss bon, uh, Bonnie and her crew that's going to Botswana. I pray that you would just keep them safe, help the Jesus film, Lord, help it to be shown and help people to to come to it, Lord, and to see the gospel illustrated before their eyes and respond in faith to what they hear. I pray that you would be with the chief, Lord, if they they could reach the chief, Lord, they have so much influence and so many open doors in that community, and I pray that you would just continue to bless them like you have, and we love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, Venus, if you want to share your testimony, and then Miss Bonnie, if you could share what, what the Lord has done already in your trip, too, that would be great. And so if, if you could share in just a, a minute or two, and then if you have a minute or two to share your, t- if you can squeeze it in, okay, this is going to be good. It's going to be worth the two minutes we go over, okay? But Venus, if you want to share your testimony.
glory. Amen. Thank you for sharing all this, man. You want to share some things that had happened leading up to your trip? And then um, you may have already shared this, I'm not sure, but Tim Pledger, the, the missionary that was with us, I think two Sundays ago, um, he gives out Jesus films. It's this production where he gives the gospel, and he bought you a Jesus film and then gave you 150 bucks to pay for the shipping too. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I forgot to mention this earlier. I understand if you can't, anybody can't do it tonight. It's a little bit last minute, but we have a parade coming up. And so we're going to need some bags, not necessarily stuff, but wait, yeah, yeah. Take out the old flyer, put in the new flyer. Um, so if you can help us out with that, I understand it's kind of last minute, but if anybody can help us take out a flyer and put in a flyer in the, in the parade bags, everything is set up in the cafeteria and whatever you could do if it's like five bags five minutes whatever it would be it would be um, a huge help um, if not we're going to get you sunday okay it'll be set up sunday and after the afternoon service it'll be set up that'll be our last chance as a church to really kind of put some put some bags together so if you can't tonight please um, prepare and plan to help us out sunday after the afternoon service well god bless you have a good yes ma'am Lord. Can't wait to hear what happens from it. So, all right. Well, good deal. God bless you. You're dismissed, and we'll see you, Lord willing, Sunday.